Today I want to talk about rhetorical frameworks, review their purpose, and talk about them in a different way also than I have talked about them in the past. You have done two already. You will do two more. Use those four to make an annotated bibliography that you will put together before we finish the revision of your initial argument and make it into a longer, more developed argument. So I want to talk a little bit about what um, rhetorical frameworks are. The purpose of them, as you'll recall, is to analyze or take apart. Um, that's what analyze means, is to take something apart. I want you to take something apart to understand it better, to come to a better understanding. That's why we do analysis anyway. We take things apart so that by looking at their individual parts, we might understand the whole better. The form that I've given is an artificial form. Um, it's just a series of questions in rhetorical categories. So here are all of our questions and um, in, in their specifics by the idea is that if you understand each one of these particular parts, if you understand who the author is, why they're believable, if you understand why they're writing when they do, if you can identify what their, who their audience is, what their purpose might be, the idea is that you can better understand what they're trying to argue. Of course, one of the key skills in life is to be able to un use these same analysis skills um, to look at anything you see, to look at any uh, a commercial, any argument, any um, essay you read, any t television program, any, any film, any news broadcast, and be able to go, okay, do I understand what's going on here? What, is they tr what are they trying to get me to do? By being aware, I think you can... Um, have more control over the way you intake information. Sources, um, where you get, you, where you've been getting your information. Um, I haven't really seen any sources that I thought were unreliable, um, that were a problem. That's why I want to talk a, a little bit, but I do want you to understand that just as I've been talking about the ability to look at a source and understand if it is something you should believe in, um, is this question of reliability. <clears throat> Can you trust the source, right? Can you trust, that's what the author question is, is this someone that you can believe and why should you believe them? You need to be able to understand why. In today's world where many people are claiming, quote, fake news about information how do you figure out what is fake and what isn't? Several semesters ago, a student said he didn't believe any of it, right? He thinks everyone, every news source is lying to him. And later when I told my husband that, my husband said, well, that's not true. We all get information from somewhere. So maybe go back and ask your students, what do they trust? What do they believe? Where do they get their information if it isn't from a news source? Where do they get it and what makes that information believable? So we all have, by this point in our lives, figured out, I trust this, I don't trust this. How do we make that decision? That's a big decision. And um, because knowing the way you decide to trust something and to act on that information is whether you think someone is reliable or not. And um, so think about that um, in your daily life. What makes me trust this information I'm getting? Why, right? There are people in this country right now who do not trust the information they are seeing um, to dis socially distance, for example, in other parts of the country. In New York, the devastation has been with so many deaths and people sick that we, we tend to believe and we are doing our best to do social keep social distance. But in other parts of the country, they, they don't think it's necessary. So, and it's because of information they have received at other sources. So who do you believe? This is a long uh, point to just say that it, it's important who you're listening to. So reliability is key for any source. I would say it's probably the most important. How do I choose a source? I want to know that it's someone I can believe. And my bullets underneath this first idea, can you trust the source, 
point out that really it's about the publisher, right? The person who is publishing this. So if someone is publishing on their own, like on YouTube, and they're just publishing, they're just saying that, saying their things and putting them up on YouTube for you to see, like I do with my these lectures, then I don't have a publishing platform. It's just I make the decision what goes in. The good thing about having a publisher is that they're responsible for the content, so they're going to employ fact checkers, right? They're going to pay people to make sure that the information that is going out is accurate. So that is already a, a defense, a line of defense of, of, or a truth, right? Is that someone's double checking it. So most of you are getting your information from the New York Times or from NPR or other reliable sources. These institutions have over many, many years. Um, for the New York Times, it's, you know, over 140 something years have been trying to build a reputation for being people who do their fact checking, who find out if something is actually true, prove that something happened, talk, talk to multiple sources, etc. And sometimes they get fooled and they print things that are not true and then it's a big deal because they work so hard at it. Other newspapers might not have that reputation, might not have, um, are able to say that they do the same. So and that, and that becomes important. Um, so whether you can trust them or not. So the, li the library databases, the reason why I think it's so important to use the library databases as you look for your sources. Number one, I told you earlier that 85% of all information is locked into these databases. It goes through a filter. 15% you see on Google. I know there's 100,000 results you get for any question you ask Google, but um, that is only 15% of the information out there. Google does not filter for reliability, but that is what you pay a database to do. So when you pay your tuition, you pay to have access to these databases, and these databases have a filter to try to make sure they are giving you reliable information. The second thing, though, you should be looking for with your sources is, will this help my argument? It might be an amazing source by someone who's a great you know, an expert and they've got so many interesting things to say that if it does not relate to what the argument you're trying to make, it's not helpful. Um, the two things that you must prove, right, are that um, this is a problem that must be solved, right? That is what your uh, first thing you have to do. You have to convince your audience that this is actually a problem, not just something that's bothering you, but is an actual problem. And then you must um, offer uh, solutions to, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and I added the quotes to the rhetorical framework so that um, you could identify what is pertinent in that source. What might you might be able to add to your argument? Um, what information? And I. Started, I wanted to get you starting to practice doing that. So that's why I added quotations. So now I want to go through and think about the rhetorical framework in a different way. I want to think about how you might look at your own writing through this lens of the rhetorical framework. So on the topic of author, you're the author, so what makes you reliable, right? You're not an expert. You can't conduct studies like Brene Brown. You didn't write lots of novels like um, Anne Lamott. So how can you establish your reliability? How can you convince someone they should believe you? So first, I think explaining your connection to the topic is always helpful. We've seen that over and over again. And then the other things that make a reader believe you are the way you use your facts, right? The f if you've considered all sides, if you're fair, if you're thorough, and you write clearly. These are the things that make you a reliable author. You cannot... You don't have a PhD, you can't conduct studies. So these other things become very, very important for you to be seen as someone reliable. Your title, we're gonna talk about titles more in when we read the chapter on the art of meta commentary and they say, I say, for now I'll just say that having a good title matters. So um, look at the titles that you, <coughs> of the articles you've read, their titles are usually, um, essentially their thesis statements. So, in just in a different form, remember that people pay money. Um, there are people whose only job, I know because there was someone in my church 
um, who used to work for the New York Times, and he, he was paid to just come up with the headlines, the titles for articles for the sports stories. So um, that is an important, uh, titles are very important. Who is your audience, right? This is super important. Um, there's an entire section in the description of his essay about audience. Um, who can make, who can change the thing that makes you so angry? Like that's who your audience is. And I think you basically have two options. One is you can write to the people in power, right? People who can make a policy that will change something, change a law or spend money in a different direction, right? Speaking to the people in power is one good audience when you want to get something changed. And that's what your purpose is, is to get people to change something. The other group is that second area down here. I know it's small on the, the slide, but it's you can write to people in people, just regular people, because in large enough numbers, um, citizens of the United States can make the most change and should make the most change. Public opinion and public ideas are important. We're the people who write to lawmakers who make the law. We're the people who um, don't buy a product if we don't think it's doing us well or that the company is um, good. We're the ones who make decisions. Um, we all have to ride, for example, we have to ride the subways. But if we all got together and staged a, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say staged a walkout, but went on strike and said we're, you know, didn't ride the subways for a few days, um, you know, once things are normal again then this MTA might start listening to our demands and saying, we expect this, we expect that, we, you have to stop, you know, something like that. So those are the two audience groups I think you have to, so think about who you think would be most effective. And then the question is, how do you appeal to that audience, right? Um, what is your tone going to be? Are you going to be funny or are you going to be very serious? What is your language? Your The level of language will tell uh, will make a difference, right? Um, uh, the facts, the stories you tell. But the most important thing is to understand the values of the people that you're writing, right? In your assignment sheet on for S for what makes me angry, it says consider the needs, attitudes, and knowledge of your uh, audience, right? What do they value? What is important to them? Um, And consider what has, uh, so what has kept the audience from fixing this problem before? And maybe say that, like address that directly in your essay. This has been a problem for this much time. It has not been addressed because of blank, blank, and blank. Or why hasn't this been addressed? We have the means. We have the, the explain that, talk about that, address that issue. I want you to think about right now uh, Governor Cuomo and the fact that he cannot reopen the state for normal business, he is saying, until he gets more help from the federal government that will give him money to create the tests that would get all of us tested and create a task force that would monitor the spread of this disease continually. He needs outside help. How does he appeal to the federal government for this? How does he try to talk to President Trump about this? How does he go about this. He succeeds and fails in both ways of doing this, right? So think about your audience. How do you appeal to them? How do you get them on your side? Sympathetic, and not just sympathetic, but willing to do something. What techniques are you going to use to, um, it, what tone are you going to take? What language? How many facts? How much of your story will you tell? All of these things will depend on how you think would most effectively appeal to your audience and you only know that by researching your audience. You have to make your topic clear early on. They need, there needs to be no doubt. And also, of course, you have to make this topic interesting to your reader. I think we're at an advantage because our audience, whoever your audience is, you're writing to them because they have a stake. They care about this problem already, right? So hopefully, um, but do mention your topic and make that very clear early on. Now, exigence. Why are you writing this when you are? The real exigence is you have an essay assignment in my class. There's no pretending that. Of course, that's why you're writing this. But I want you to pretend, right? I want you to think about, okay, 
how would I get something? I want something to be changed. So explain why you're writing now. What recent event happened? For those of you writing about things related to um, distance learning, the distance learning you've been forced to do in this college, then it's easy, right? We all have a recent event, something that has happened that has forced us because of this um, virus. Um, for those of you who, though, who are writing about climate change, that's a really important topic, but why did you want to talk about it now? Is there something that happened um, recently that made you think about this? Have you been thinking about it for a long time? And is it something that you never stop thinking about? Something like that. You need to kind of state that somewhere, right? Often the exigence, um, you in our rhetorical frameworks in general, as a class, we miss it. It's hard for us to figure it out. But I, I'm telling you, as someone who is looking for this, almost every single author that you have sent me of, with an article, almost every single one has, in fact, uh, they state the exigence. They state, this recent thing happened, and therefore I am. They tell you flat out. So um, I think that is something you need to do also. Is state why you're writing about this now. Now, of course, we've talked about um, you need to have a clear statement, stating what you're going to prove, right? This is what I want to change. And the location should be in the first paragraph, right? Unless you open with a story, which you can do because that will draw your reader in, and that's a great way to open. But eventually, you have to state your thesis clearly. That is something I expect you to do. Now, non-academic writing, again, if you're looking at, as you analyze these different articles you've been working on, you, you know that people do not always state, make a statement that would be called a clear one-sentence summary of what they're trying to argue. Um, and it's rarely located at the end of the first paragraph. So there are lots of models of where and to put your thesis. For us, for academic writing, for the rest of your college career, you're going to state your thesis early on. What are you trying to argue? What are you trying to say? Right? That is something we're going to practice here. Now your purpose, right? Clear is what you want people to do or say differently. You need to clearly state this up front and then often multiple times it needs to be stated i have found in reading the articles that you have sent that you've done your rhetorical frameworks on that people do that all writers do that not just academic you know not just in the classroom they do it over and over they'll tell you what they want to get done certainly by the end they try to make a case look this is something you should change it's a problem and then by the end they're just flat out we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to maybe even do this or so you need to, um, what do you want people to think or do differently, right? What is it? State it often. Now, for techniques to use, of course, like the people you have been reading, you should have facts and statistics and tell your story. But here's the thing. I'm requiring you to use outside help. Maybe some of the people that you have looked at, they only tell their own personal story or make an argument based on their expertise. But because you don't have any, quote, expertise yet, you have to. I'm forcing you, right? You have to use four sources where you talk from um, to experts, you people who have done studies. You quote statistics and facts. You use their opinions because they're expert opinions. They are experts because of the education they have, the studies they have done, or just the fact that they have written about or talked about the one subject for so long, right? That's what makes someone an expert. So I'm forcing you to rely on those techniques. In addition, I'm expecting you um, to use your writing skills to be effective, to effectively uh, respond to um, uh, questions in your essay. So here are some of the moves that we have made, right? We've already gone over. You're going to summarize what's happened so far. What is this topic? What have people said in the past? I'm joining this conversation. You're going to integrate your sources well so it doesn't feel clunky. You're going to state who's saying it up front so, that, so the reader knows, okay, I'm about to hear from someone besides the author. And then after you give your quote, you're going to explain what the importance of that quote, how it proves your point. You're going to anticipate objections. You're going to make sure everything is connected, every sentence, every idea. You're going to state why it matters and provide meta-commentary. Those two things we have not practiced, but we will 
before this essay is finished. So these are the techniques that you will use to effectively um, persuade your reader. Um, and then finally, I have um, asked you to add quotations to your rhetorical frameworks. It is not part of analysis. Analysis, again, is taking things apart. Um, and I guess in a way this is, you're, you're trying to find individual quotes, um, so you are taking it apart a little bit and explain why you think those quotes are important. But mainly I'm trying to help you um, identify interesting information and practice discussing the quote, which again is one of the skills that you must use to be an effective persuader, especially in an academic setting. So I have set the quotations up recently to help take that step. When you give me your rhetorical frameworks, when you send those to me, I respond. I try really hard to read the article itself and then respond to it by telling you what I think works, what you've missed, so that as you, by, by critiquing careful and reading more carefully the work you have done, I'm trying to make sure you understand your source and then you use it effectively in your essay. So this has been a review of um, rhetorical frameworks, but as you, I'm looking at it not only as you doing a rhetorical framework, but as you taking on the role of the author and some of the things that you should do to make your writing more effective.